motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Welcome to the School for Mothers podcast. I'm your host, Danusha Melina Durban, and I'm so happy you're tuning in. I'm here to give you and other mothers with ambitions, tools, resources, and dollops of humor to show you different ways mums around the world are living mothers and lives. I founded School for Mothers, SFM, because I really do know how mothers can retain and grow ourselves as women of great talent and impact, while at the same time raising happy families. We'll be exploring this more in future episodes. In many ways, this School for Mothers show is an antidote to all those doom and gloom stories about what's possible once we become mums. We'll be upending myths, bringing possible solutions and sharing gritty decisions, the ones behind our lives. Before we get there, this episode is sponsored by Me Sheets, my simple but incredibly effective system to get mothers not only doing the things they want to, but as important, if not more, Me Sheets reinstall mothers bang smack in the centre of their own lives. We all know how easy it is to meet everyone else's needs, but by the end of the day, week, month, year, to realise that somehow you've not got to the things that you dearly want to do. Think of it like needing to go to the bathroom. If you're like me, you'll register you need to go, but then for whatever reason you put this simple bladder task off until the very last moment. In my life, I managed to do... Oh, I don't know, say 15 other jobs before I finally accept that, hey, if I don't go now, things might get embarrassing. Let's loop back to me sheets then. What me sheets do is help you take yourself from low on your list of priorities to undeniably at the center. And if that isn't good enough, me sheets model to our kids that taking care of their own needs is a must. To get Me Sheets delivered right into your hands so that each day you feature in all you do, listeners, Me Sheets won't let you struggle on with the crumbs. Go to schoolformothers.com forward slash Me Sheets. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash Me Sheets. Anyhow, on to this week's episode called Alien. My guest today then is Hannah Martin, an amazing entrepreneur, founder of Talented Ladies Club known as TLC an online magazine and training provider for ambitious, working, freelance and business mothers. As if that wasn't enough, she's also an award-winning advertising copywriter and qualified psychotherapist, hypnotherapist and NLP practitioner. I've had the pleasure of being on the stage speaking alongside Hannah many, many times and she always shares stellar practical takeaways. Hannah is definitely one hell of a private person So to have her agree to talk about big, courageous decisions in her search to make a difference in the world is something of a coup. She saw a need to address the issue that so many talented women are forced to give up their career once they become mothers. With TLC, Hannah leads the way, proving that motherhood doesn't prevent you from reaching your dreams. Hannah is very much a driven mother on a mission. Listen out for when Hannah and I discuss identity issues there really is a reason why this episode is called Alien, and it might not be what you think. Hannah's such an example of a woman who's turned challenges into advantages. Takeaways on this are exactly what I think my listeners can apply to their own lives as well. Okay, let's dive into today's episode. Hannah, I have so many questions for you today, absolutely oodles of them. And it's such a pleasure to have a conversation about the subject alien. I mean, that's quite an unusual one, I think. What do you think? Um, yes, it is quite a, it's quite a strange one. It's probably very fitting. <laughs> it's fitting. Well, you know, it takes me a while to kind of tune in to not just you, but obviously all the women that are featured and showcased on the School for Mothers podcast. And, and when I came to you, because we've, we've had the benefit of, you know, not only sharing a, a hotel room, long journeys and, um, you know, kind of exhibition, kind of the challenges of 
exhibiting and uh, and the pleasures and the fun. And so we've we've been through a few things and spent a lot of time together, I think. So Alien is something that I happened upon because in our conversations, what I really loved is when you've talked about your journey of running from ordinary and what that has meant to you. And I just thought, God, most people wouldn't really hear that story. And I think that it might spark off some some ideas for them. So tell me, what was your journey from kind of spill the beans on what led you to kind of run from ordinary? I don't know. I mean, I guess on the one hand, I was always quite ordinary. I was one of four children. So even growing up, I was one of a group. So we we were just the kids. And if our parents went anywhere, um, they couldn't deal with four different choices and things. So we were often dressed the same. We were ordered the same food. So I was sort of part of a collective. I didn't really stand out in that respect. And I met this, you know, I had a great upbringing. My parents were wonderful parents. But, you know, when you've got four children born within four years, as my parents had us very quickly, um, you do tend to get on together. And so when I was at school, there was nothing particularly exceptional about me. I studied, I studied, you know, reasonably well enough. I went under the radar. But I guess it, it in the midst of all this, whereas in some ways I was outwardly quite ordinary, I never really felt like I fitted in, ever. I mean, I, I even from a young age, I, I find it very difficult to make friends, very difficult to relate to people. I never really felt like I was like other people. So I think that manifested in the, the choices as an adult it's enabled me to make decisions or not to not to feel the need of the security of the crowd because I never really felt that I really belonged to a particular group. So therefore I don't have a fear of losing the group. You know, like sometimes if you make big life decisions, that could take you away from a security of an identity that, that comes from a collective that you're part of. And I never I never had that as a child. And I also had this fear of being sucked into a life that I didn't want. I think I grew up in a very small village. My worst fear was marrying a local boy, buying a house in, in, a, in an estate in the village and working in a local business and my life being kind of very small. So I had this real desire to go and see the world and, and do things and do something that, that really meant something to me. Mm. That's quite a combination, isn't it? That kind of collectivism. And I, I love the image that you, you created by saying that you were dressed the same. I mean, I, I, gosh, I'd love to see pictures of all four of you. Was it girls? Uh, three girls and a boy. And often, because my parents are very poor, so they often we were in handmade clothes. So, which is one of the reasons I really, <laughs> you know, we were quite different at school because we were very close in age. We were very unusual surname. So we were known for being a large family and, you know, we were often in either hand-me-down clothes or homemade clothes. So it's kind of like a weird thing. So on the one hand, at home, I was like one of a, a mass. Kind of, I didn't really, didn't really spend individual one-on-one time with my parents. I, didn't, I wasn't I didn't really doing anything that you, you were just kind of one of the kids. But then at school, I was quite different in that I didn't really fit in and I didn't wear fashionable clothes. So I didn't you know, I was always apart from the crowd. Yeah, that is a a fascinating combination, isn't it? Because that kind of almost lumped in, as you say, in a a group, but but different, so marked out at school is quite a stark difference. And also, as you talk about this, um, one of the things that I notice, I mean, listeners won't know, unless they go take a look at your lovely photos on Talented Ladies Club and and online, uh, you know, you're a real hip, cool fashion you know I love what you wear very simple but I, I've got a clue as we're talking that that's maybe come out of you know the history the legacy of uh, you know having to wear hand-me-downs and homemade clothes I talk by the way as somebody that had to do that but I haven't necessarily become as fashionable as you I love what you wear so here you were under the radar in some ways above you know very much on the radar in others but not really fitting in. So what did you do? What did I do? I, I, I just tried to survive my childhood in, in <laughs> terms of... And I actually, and I, and I love, I mean, I love how you picked the title for this because I remember at senior school sitting in assembly and looking out at the quadrangle and wishing almost an alien spacecraft landed 
Mm. And they say, oh, Hannah, come back home. You're one of us. Almost that would kind of answer like why I wasn't like anyone else. And they would go, oh, now we get it. You're an alien. <laughs> That's why, <laughs> why you're so different. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I don't know necessarily if people really saw that in me or, you know, certainly I stood out for the clothes that I wear. I wore, sorry. But I certainly felt very different. I didn't. And then this is the thing as well. I didn't. I learned social skills very late. So I learned them actually by watching other people and copying them. But when I was at school, I really struggled with how to socialise other people. So I didn't understand the language of friendships and the language of, you know, communication between different people which is another reason why I I sort of felt very much an outsider. So what did you notice? What did you actually have to, you know, when you were, when you were noticing the social skills, you know, basically how things work, you know, how to make friends. (laughs) Yeah. What did you actually have to take yourself through in terms of a process? I observed people who were social, I would say socially fluent. So people who kind of would glide through relationships, people naturally gravitated towards, who seemed comfortable talking to other people. It wasn't necessarily a conscious planned thing, but I used to, what I used to do was I grew up in the country, so no one, I grew up quite far from my school, so no, none of my school friends lived in my village. So I would just spend hours cycling on my bike around the village, just in a world of fantasy, and in this world of fantasy, as I got to my sort of mid to late teens, I started creating this version of me in my head that I really wanted to be. And it was built on an amalgamation of all the people that I knew, who I admired, as in that seemed to get through life a lot, e- lot more easy than I did. And you know, subsequently qualifying as a therapist, I, under- I can understand now that the- I was essentially rewiring my brain. I was mentally rehearsing scenarios over and over again that I would want to be different in and then my brain was creating this complex and I, I for a while in my early 20s uh, my life was, is I actually thought I had magic powers for a very short period of time because all these things I would play in my head were actually coming true I, I was finding myself in situations that I was dreaming about and I just thought this is really freaky now obviously I understand I was creating these templates and and my brain was enabling them to happen. And I did become the person I wanted to be. And it, you know, after what initially any change that you make is going to feel strange and it's going to feel a bit weird and different. But if you consistently act in in a particular way, over time that does become the natural way that you are. And now I love my, I've got wonderful friends. I love people. I find it very easy to make friends. I really treasure my friendships. And that comes naturally to me, but it has been learned as an adult rather than there are some people that just seem to be born with a natural uh, idea of how they make friends. And, and I think actually I, I'm really glad about this way around because I understand what it's like to not be like this, which I think gives you an, an understanding and appreciation of how other people work. It hasn't come easily to me, so therefore I really treasure it and I really value my friendship. Don't take them for granted. Well, also, what I'm hearing you say is that you have learned to be with your own company. So you know that you can be with yourself as well as you've actually learned. You've kind of carved out the neural pathways, as I, I would put it, that kind of that rewiring process. Mm-hmm. You've, you've done that by those rehearsals. And now you know how to make friends. You know? Yes. So one of the things that I used to do as a child, and you're really making me think about it when you say that you were rehearsing these different scenarios. I was adopted, and I took a while noticing these popular girls. You know, I observed the girls that seemed to have happy families. And by the way, they weren't adopted. I was the only adopted person I knew in my world at that time. And and that made me different. So I was like, oh, I wonder if I try out how she is, Mm. whether my parents will respond differently to me or whether my world will respond differently to me. And so I took a child, a different girl at a time. So I'd do a week as uh, Sharon and a week as Kasia. And I was very much in the Polish community and a week as another girl. And sure enough, I did get different responses, unsurprisingly, but also my God, my parents were called into school and they were worried that perhaps I had some kind of multiple personality problem (laughs) or that I was actually a remarkably you know astute actress and they couldn't they they couldn't work out 
is your mental health problem that you know you haven't thought about or so each week she seems to be adopting a different personality <laughs> and actually you know it's funny now I, I realized obviously that you know I, I, my parents were going to treat me as they were going to treat me anyway my life was mine and I'd have to you know ride that as, as you said ride my childhood and and do with it what I could because it was you know it was relatively turbulent whatever that means but it really really gave me a whole window and that's what I'm hearing you know with yours it gave you a window into you know, how things work how actually impact mm. you know how, mm. how to consciously in a way create what you want and actually if you adopt a certain way that you you can as you said it will actually arrive it, it will come to you absolutely that result that you were hoping for I think that's the really wonderful part about those kind of experiments because it sounds very experimental yet I hear that driven through both of our stories actually is a sense of being different and I wonder does everybody does every human being really think they're that person that's different I wonder what do you think probably yes because Actually, we we see people out in the world and we make assumptions about how they feel or don't feel. But actually, all of us have feelings that don't necessarily match up to the, 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 the face you put onto the world. And, mm. and actually, we are all unique. All of us are individual. Maybe we all do feel that. But what I particularly love about the experience that, you know, that you've had and I've had is that it gives you an awareness that you do get to choose who you want to be. We're not kind of a piece of driftwood on an ocean. We, we have a motor and we can decide where how where we want to go and how we want people to respond to us because people only respond to what we, to how what we give them and they've got their own baggage and their own impressions and 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 things like that but to a greater extent we can control how we come across to people and how they respond to us and how we feel and this is lessons I really try to give my children is that you're not stuck with the personality that you think you have. You can keep it if you want, but if there are elements of your character that you feel don't really serve you or that might hold you back, that you don't enjoy, you can choose to change them. And it, it's not something that's necessarily simple or easy or quick, but it is absolutely possible. And it's, and it's there and available to everybody if they choose it. Yes. Yes, it is. It's, it's really important to tell our children that. And I think I'm not sure that as I, it's partly why I wanted to talk to you, you know, have this conversation with you. It's because I don't often hear people talking about the fact that you can actually create. I mean, I know you can create who you are, and, you know, but not in this way about your personality. I guess it's where you shine a light, mm. you know, I, you know, because it's what you focus on grows. And so there is a conscious choice about it. And that's what I love. And definitely as mothers, that's, so important but also for women who want to make a difference in the world and are making a difference in the world you know that means that we have to consciously now think about you know what are we foregrounding prioritizing in ourselves mm -hmm. so tell me about talented ladies club how did you get there how, like from that young girl cycling around a, a very country village making up you know scenarios of who you could be in the world well, how did you arrive at Talented Ladies? Well, there were a lot happened in between, <laughs> between those two things. <laughs> yeah, of um, course. <laughs> but but in, in essence, I mean, I created Talented Ladies Club because, partly because I was, I was bored. Um, I was freelancing from home. And while I built up a successful freelance business, I'd left behind a career in advertising in London at a top agency, working on really creative jobs. And the work I was doing freelance wasn't as creatively stimulating. So I, I was, we had a real drive. I always had a drive to be creative. So I wanted something creative. But also it, the, the motivation for doing it was because I saw there was something missing. I've always been a very driven person and I don't like to accept second best, as in I don't want to have a compromised life. Not as in I want the best, but I just don't want to compromise on things that are really important to me. So I was really driven to, to do things I love and earn money at it in my career and to continue doing that even though I was a mother. But I saw my friends giving up. I saw them being defeated by the lack of opportunities for working mothers and, and not know what to do next. And when I looked around online, there was no real narrative out there that inspired women at that time. This, this is 
going back to, I think I started looking in 2011, there were at that time very few sites out there talking to women, queer women at all, or queer mothers, sorry. And those that did were sort of like, you know, maybe you can do a bit of admin work part time from home. Oh, lovely. Sort of, sort of, I know exactly. And I just thought that's really depressing. And to me, that the, the sort of final catalyst for starting it was two mums in my son's year. One was a solicitor, one was an architect. They both worked in London. And they were current at that time. They were looking for part-time admin work in our town because they felt that was all they could get. And they weren't even securing that because they were so overqualified that they weren't even successful in getting those roles. And I thought, that's really depressing. How can that sustain you as a person? How can that be enjoyable for you? How can that use your talents? So that I decided to create something that inspired women, that told them and showed them that they could still want all the things that ever wanted. And then somehow help them get it. Oh, I mean, we're going to come on to, you know, the uh, amazing business that you've created with Talented Ladies. But let's stick with this depressing scenario of of those women who, frankly, are all of us will know women who've gone to university, trained in a professional career for years and years, and then have children. And then almost the, the template is... Okay, so now I compromise myself. Now I just I take a job that is that is not you know matching my talents or my professional expertise. I mean, I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing it at the moment so much. Yes, and there's a lot. There's been a lot in the media, as as should be about postnatal depression, and what we do, particularly if we are we pursue careers that we love so it's not just about earning money it's about using your talents it's feeling fulfilled it's doing things you enjoy it's being useful in the world making a difference and when you're in your 20s or early 30s before you have children and when you meet someone one of the first things you will do is they will ask you or you will tell them what do you do your career is part of identity the people that you surround yourself with they are today your colleagues or people who have the same interests and skill levels as you and when you have children if you don't return to that environment and are able to to still work in the same way you lose identity and that's a huge massive part of who you are and then to have that taken away from you is is bound to affect your mental health yes it is bound to affect your mental health and I think one of the underlying problems uh, that I'm still seeing is that fundamentally women's identity is really still anchored in their ability to become a mother and so despite being lawyers doctors I could reel off reel off uh, all those professional careers and roles and it isn't just for a certain segment of working woman I mean all work it's it's what you said it's about being useful it's contributing it's having a purpose beyond the facility of our wombs I think that's it but in a way I just wonder if society still really tethers and anchors women's true like not truest or almost like the unspoken still is that women ultimately motherhood is their identity that's their highest purpose I just wonder about that I rather than men it's assumed that when they become fathers well of course they retain their identity you know, they, their work role actually is their real identity. Yes, they're a father, but that's the one that is their, their core identity. Whereas mm. ours, if we were a stick of rock, would it be mother or would it say lawyer? Would it say, do you know what I mean? Am I making one? I completely agree. And there's also, you know, the opposite of that when people don't have children. If you meet a woman in her late 40s who is without children, you, you know, a lot of the time they'll be asked, why? Why didn't you have children? Yes. But you wouldn't have the man. You would feel sorry for a woman in her late 40s without children. You'd think that somehow she'd failed or she'd lost something because she hadn't become a mother. And you wouldn't have the same initial, those thoughts wouldn't be applied. Those emotions wouldn't be applied to a man, I don't think. Well, that's right, because a man's life is not kind of legitimised by having children. Hmm. It's his... What has he contributed? What has he created in the world in terms of career? What do you do? Whereas women's, one of the first questions is, you know, your children. That then frames your life. So it's about 
your life and children. Absolutely. I was interviewing a, a very senior Chinese um, official yesterday, and she actually asked me about children. And to be honest, I really didn't want that in the in the conversation because I've got so many children and it can take over a conversation easily. And so I tried very, you know, as, as nicely as I could just say, yes, I've got 10. And then I had to ask because, and I didn't want to. And I had the intuition anyway that she didn't have children and she didn't. Mm-hmm. And she was apologetic. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was just like, oh no, please don't apologize. I, because the assumption would be that obviously I'm pro-children, that I think everyone should be mothers. This is totally not the case, by the way. I do not think that at all. But I I was really struck by her apologetic manner, that somehow she had not made the grade. Mm. And it really saddened me. And I see, I see women do this. I also do see and 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 know amazing women who are very, very at peace with the fact that no, that's not what I wanted. You know, that's, I knew I wouldn't have children or it just didn't happen. And we were absolutely at peace with that. And that makes me really happy because I don't like, I don't like the very thought that our daughters will still have to navigate this conversation about their truest purpose in the world or their identity, like through the lens of, are you going to have a child or not? Mm. Or just that your life is somehow less valid or less fulfilled if you haven't become a mother. Yes. And as a, as a mother of a teenager, I can tell you, life is just more complicated if you're a mother. It's not more fulfilled, necessarily. Well, I wonder, I wonder when we really become fulfilled as mothers. No, I, I actually, I, I, I personally believe fulfillment has to come just internally from you. You cannot look for external validation, fulfillment or happiness. Those things have to come entirely from you. Then you have got the mental and emotional capacity to give out to others. But if you are seeking ex- external fulfillment, validation or happiness, I don't think you'll ever really acquire it. Because I don't think being a mother can fulfill you. I think you need to be self-fulfilled mm-hmm. rather than look for something else to do that for you. Yeah, it's a little suspicion of mine that that I wonder if women, some women, think that their children will give them fulfilment. That's an awful burden. And I, I, well, it's a, it's an enormous burden on the child for sure. And I can honestly say that I'm not fulfilled through any of my ten children. You know, and if I was waiting for them to make me happy, then I'd be it'd be a long time coming. And so that's very separate from a very deep sense you know a very deep love for them and from them and and actually immense growth through having them so my personal growth is is enormous because of the the adventures we've gone on and uh, I don't mean the fun I mean the challenges as well but fulfilled because of them nah now they're far too hard work <laughs> you know I'm just like <laughs> they're just <laughs> that's a nightmare of complexity that that yes. I've created and I take responsibility for. You know, I clearly needed to learn a lot. <laughs> you know, I clearly did, but because it's not a breeze, it really isn't. But so let, of course, you know, and as teenagers, oh god, yeah, aren't they wonderful? Actually, <laughs> hopefully they end up with being wonderful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get asked, you know, about whether boys or girls are easiest, you know, in general. I think it's personalities. You have, you know, when you have more than one child, you understand that that each child is born with their own distinct personality and that male or female, you can have easy boys, difficult girls, easy girls, difficult boys. Yes. Yes, you can. I mean, I I had my first four in four years, like you grew up in, and four boys. And I would say that... I would say I got the smelly, stinky end of uh, adolescence in one wodge, if you like. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, it's girls next. And that's very different. And then I got a, and I'm getting, as we're in it, you know, the kind of hormonal uh, roller coaster. Mm. But uh, so it was smelly and active and noisy. And then it's become hormonal and emotional and, and unpredictable mm. and wild because of course that's what 
I think femininity is and, mm. and you know amazing and then of course I've got the triplets that are both so that'll be fascinating to be with but yeah I, I think at different stages of life it can be boys you know the genders show up differently I think mm. if you've if you've been easy personality girl at a young age then it might be teenagers the teenage time that's you know harder uh, mm. But then again, you can have a very complex, you know, just a more challenging um, youngster. So it's, it, yes, I completely agree with you completely. So tell me about your adventures from, you know, en route to talented ladies. What did you um, do to escape your ordinary life? Yeah, so I did, I went to art college because that seemed to me the most, I wanted something creative and that, that fitted with me. But I dropped out after the second year of my fine art degree and I felt really lost then. I remember going to see a careers officer and saying, you know, I don't know what I want to do. I know it's creative, but I haven't got a clue. And she said to me, well, really, you haven't got any qualifications, so I'll just get a secretarial job. And it was like my worst nightmare come true. Um, I remember my mum saying, when I was at school, insisting I did a Pitman's typing exam because I'd never be out of work. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, a life where I'm resorting <laughs> to a typist. <laughs> you are cracking me up. <laughs> I know. Uh, so um, I, I did, I think I, did, I was deliberately really bad at typing because I really did not want that to much. I didn't want to fall back, and I did not want that to fall back. So for a careers officer to then suggest that, was, was hell. It was horrible. I was really depressed at that time. So I decided that if I had to get a rubbish job, because that's all I was told I could get, uh, a terrible careers officer, <laughs> um, I'd at least do it somewhere exotic. So I, so I worked for a year to save up money and I bought a one way ticket to Hong Kong. Now, I'd never been to Hong Kong. I didn't have anyone, know anyone there. I didn't have a job. I didn't have friends. I didn't have a home. But I just wanted to escape and I and just wanted to this trap that I saw of being living in my small village or town and marrying someone local and getting a job as a, as a secretary, I saw it looming ever closer and I had to escape it. So I bought that one-way ticket and I absolutely loved it. Um, I spent five years in Hong Kong. I really grew up there. I mean, I, I had to, I was incredibly shy as well. I mean, I was so shy before I went to Hong Kong. If I got on a bus... I wouldn't press the bell to get off at the stop because it, that was too public. So I would just sit and wait till someone stopped near me and I would get off at the same stop as them. I was that shy. I was really, oh. you know, it, it literally almost sort of in, in a social term, handicapped on my shyness. But going to Hong Kong and not knowing anybody, I had to to meet people. I had to make friends. I had to find somewhere to live. I had to find a job. Um, and it was brilliant. And while I was over there, I discovered that advertising existed as, as, a, as a career. Um, and I had a boyfriend at the time who worked for an agency, a big agency. And I went in on Saturday with him to pick up something from his desk. And he was an art director. And I walked in and just thought, oh, my gosh, I just felt at home in the creative department of an agency. This is where I want to be. And I sort of looked at the work that the writers were doing and thought, well, I could do that. So I found out that Ogilvy and Mather were looking for a new writer. So I managed to get an interview with the executive case director and went to this meeting and he clearly thought I was he was interviewing an experienced copywriter rather than someone that dropped out of an art degree and that's about the extent of her experience. But I talked him into giving me a test. I think partly to just get rid of me. He set me a writing test on the basis that he hired me. And so started a 21 year career in writing, which I absolutely loved. I loved advertising. It was my home. I just really loved this, the bunch of misfits that generally end up in creative departments, ad agencies, and the independent thing. It fitted the way that I thought and felt. You know, you had to think quite differently to be a really good creative. And I won awards for my work. It turned out I was naturally really good at it. I loved it. It never felt like work. I always loved it. And yeah, so then I came back. I went travelling, came back to the UK in 2000, and yeah, and haven't looked back. <laughs> oh God! Oh, I mean, a kind of social social handicap of of such introvertedness and shyness, through to 
buying a one-way ticket to Hong Kong. I mean, come on now. That's that's but, like so. Um, but you know what? <laughs> it seems like when you when you talk about it in that context, and when I tell people about it today. They say, oh, what an incredibly brave thing to do. But it wasn't. And this is the thing. And this is, you know, if anyone is listening to this and they're going through a really difficult time in life, and you only realise this in hindsight because when you're in a difficult time, it is just hell. And I do know that. Those times are gifts because you can be truly brave in those times. Because if life is comfortable, and I think this has been my advantage because I have been, and you know, and, and you and I have talked and I had an abusive marriage when I came back to the UK. So there have been very difficult times in my life. But those have all been gifts because in times of difficulty, you get to be brave because when life is comfortable, when life is easy, you don't want to lose that security. So you hold on to that security. So you don't make brave decisions because you don't want to risk losing what is very comfortable. Mm -hmm. But when you are in discomfort, when your life is not how you want it to be, when you are depressed and when you are are lost it is easier to make bold decisions because you haven't got anything to lose because if that decision goes wrong it doesn't matter because you're already in hell so a new hell is just a different hell um so when people sort of look back at that decision and think wow that was a really brave how can you go from being so shy and doing such a brave thing actually that was it would have been harder to stay harder to confront this life that was sucking me into this vortex of safeness and ordinariness and and a life that just just really I would I would have hated it was much easier to say I've got to get out and the only way to, that I can see to get out is to do something extreme so it wasn't a it was really I guess the only decision I could have made for me yeah and I think it's it's funny how people equate that kind of response and action with bravery and courage when as you say what choice did you have actually to stay in the hell you were in or to try something different Mm. and it needed to be extreme and it generally does it's almost to the extent it's like a it's inextricably linked to the extent of the hell you're in the leap that you need to make so for me it really really shows yeah you had to do something that big (laughs) to to escape and to to survive actually to thrive, yes. to find yourself. Absolutely. And what is brilliant is that once you push the edges of your comfort zone out, they never come back in. Mm. No one can ever take that experience away from you. And, you know, when you, so when you make those decisions, you, haven't, you don't really lose anything because even if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, you've learned things, you've changed, you've grown, you've met new people, you've gone to new places. Whatever that experience has given you, it, it's always a win. There's never a loss. Yes, you integrate that into who you are. And as a result, the boundaries of your selfhood in a, in a funny old way become bigger. So yeah. you grow and you also, as you say, even if it's the biggest fuck up, excuse my language, you know who you are. You're a bigger person and you know you've done it, whatever it is. So, yeah, it, it's very big, actually. It really is big. You're also reminding me of a remarkable woman whose name is Marky, Mikey R.G. And she's one of the leading activists in this country and a mother of two beautiful girls who has led the way and paved the way for all of the, the kind of legal case for thalidomide people in this country. And so the money that's being given back by the uh, drug companies, the pharmaceutical companies, and Mikey's been at the head of this. And she's, you know, she's a she ha- has been affected by thalidomide and she calls herself a woman with short arm short arms and she's a really truly remarkable woman and has backpacked around the world and you know is not compromised in terms of her fulfillment and the size of her life by uh, thalidomide but she um said to me not long ago why do people keep saying i'm brave and like what do they mean by I'm brave with these arms? It's like, she, she said, Danusha, what was I supposed to do with my life? I wasn't being brave. I'm not being brave. I'm living. You know, I'm mm. living with the cards that life has dealt me. I happen to have very short arms, you know, and therefore she lives from that place. 
you really remind me of her because what were you supposed to do? Continue and I mean, I, I guess go downhill. You know, be even or give up. It's the fact to give up. Isn't it? Well, it's become hopeless, yes, or give up, or take extreme action and see where that takes you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you did. So, um, where can people find you for talented ladies? Where's the best way for listeners to actually experience what you do? They can visit our site, which is talentedladiesclub.com. So we publish daily content that said it, it, we have an, uh, an ethos of positive honesty. So what we do is we talk about the realities of what it's like to be a woman and a mother uh, and to be ambitious. And we talk about it honestly, but it's, it's all empowering. So the site is designed to uplift you to make you want and, and, and feel you're entitled to want the things you do in life and then to show you how you can get them um, through the articles on our site. And we also do training courses as well. I love that. So to feel that you're entitled to mm. what you would love, you know, what, what would make you feel fulfilled as a woman and mother. Oh, that's a great distinction. That's really, really great. Love it. Absolutely. When you are fulfilled and happiness only really comes from fulfillment. As in, when I say fulfilled, it means being you, being the person that you really fully want to be, you've got plenty to give the world. If everyone was fulfilled, the world would be a very different place. We wouldn't be putting people down, holding people back. We only act in negative ways when we're unhappy. Yeah, we do. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me about these, these training courses. What do you train people about? Uh, so they're linked to the sort of career and business side. So we try to create practical courses that enable you to take realistic steps towards what you want to do. So we have courses on getting your LinkedIn profile correct so people can find you on LinkedIn and you can use it with confidence. Of course, I've got a course on Twitter, a course on um, getting your CV done, a course on a brilliant career audit. So if you're feeling a bit lost and you're not sure where you are, where you should be, where you want to be, we've got a downloadable workbook. We've got a, a course that helps you start a business. I'm about to launch a new VAP coaching program. So there's lots and lots of different courses. Mm. And one of the things I really love about you, Hannah, is that you're very practical, down to earth. And I mean, you're like this mine of wisdom. I We're often on panels together. And every single time that we sit on one of these panels together, you like, I think to myself, wow. <laughs> That's another area that I didn't know Hannah knew about. And, and also that you, you always give the audience very actionable steps that they can really walk away and, and do something with rather than, you know, that, oh, well, here's me very successful. You know, I'll, I'll throw you a tip and you might be like me one day <laughs> kind of approach. No, it's always so usable you know, immediately. And I, that I really rate. So I have a final question for you, actually. And it relates to what you talked about in terms of discomfort and, and, and how much discomfort is, in fact, a, a gift. So if when we're comfortable, we try to shore up and keep the status quo and we don't take brave kind of, you know, the big bold actions, I, I'd love you to share what's your boldest action that you're about to take in your life? or business, or, you know, anywhere. Where, where's your boldest one coming up next? Uh, well, I'm about to get married for a second time. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty bold. When, when are you going to get married? Uh, in October this year. But no, I mean, that, that's, um, that's a bit jokey. We've been together for 11 years, so it's hardly a, a leap into the unknown. <laughs> but when you've been divorced once, getting married a second time is always brave. But I think for me, I am I'm doing a PR coaching program at the moment with a, a PR coach. So for me, I, I, there's, there's still an element of shyness in there. And I've always hidden behind the TLC brand. Um, but now I need to come out and actually put myself out there and, and, and be, 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 be heard and be seen as me rather than as a, as a brand. So for me, that's quite an, a new thing for me, again, taking myself out of my comfort zone and putting myself out there. Yeah, it is. And not surprisingly, because you're, you're not really going to be able to make yourself into an extrovert or, a, you know, that the very kind of nub of you, the crux of you is always going to be that, that shy introvert. So 
you know that's part of the the really sacred beauty of you that you're you are so giving and generous in the business world and to to women and mothers yet you are quite contained you're not that loud brash extroverted kind of brand big brand presence in yourself and um I'm really looking forward to seeing how you bring more of Hannah to the world um, rather than talented ladies because, you know, you're absolutely wonderful. And, yeah, I really, I'm really looking forward to that. And that is brave. And also I'm just hoping, I'm hoping you'll tell me I need to buy a hat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just to put you on the spot, yeah, I mean, no, we, we can edit this out, but, like, listen, girl. <laughs> Of course. I'm hoping to, to share a glass of champagne with you. You will. I, I will. I will see you before then. So I will give you. Well, I'll see you very soon. So absolutely. So there you have it. I know I loved learning so much from Hannah, learning us into her world. I hope you loved this episode too. If you've gleaned some nuggets of inspiration or simply enjoyed the conversation between Hannah and myself, you might also really love the Private School for Mothers Facebook community. You can find us on Facebook by searching for School for Mothers Group. That's School for Mothers Group. Message me also at podcast at schoolformothers.com with your feedback about this episode. You can always send me ideas of who you want me to be in conversation with too, or any questions you have. I cannot wait to be here next week with special guest Daria Heideglu. Her episode's called Hitch, and all I can say is... Things get hotter than expected. Hope you'll come listen. Talk to you soon. Have a great week. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 